If you have a Bible, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. If you've been coming for some time, you know that the way in which we typically uh, approach this part of our worship and uh, in our preaching is we... We just go through a book of the Bible at a time, and, and let me just tell you why we do this, and I feel like just because of what we're getting ready to talk about, I think this, this provides, like it makes sense like later on, but um, we, just, we just believe that this is the Word of God, that this isn't just, um, just a collection of books that gives us some good advice or is uh, something that would be, uh, you know, it's 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 it would be a good idea if you were you know to, to take some take some of these principles and put them into your life. They can't they can't they can't hurt, right? And uh, but that's that's not the way we approach the Bible. We we look at the Bible and we see that this is it is God's word. And if it is God's word, that means that it is the authority for our life. If God is the one who's created um, us and created the world, He created our life. He designed our life to go in a particular way. Then we want to know what that is. And 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 by His kindness, by His, his mercy and His goodness, He has laid that out for us right here. And so it doesn't give us space and it would be foolish of us to try to take it and twist it. And it certainly would be foolish of us to ignore it. Um, And so the wisest thing, the thing that we can do that is for our greatest benefit, our greatest joy is to go, what does it say? Now let's just do that. Um, it, it, regardless of how uncomfortable it is or how awkward it can be or how inconvenient it, it might be, that if this really is God's word and he has said this is the way life goes, then, then we, just, we just want we want to be smart enough uh, to go, then I want to do that and, uh, and, and realize that this is God we're talking about. And, uh, and, and, and when it comes to God versus me, God always wins that. God is always best. He's always, he is all wise, all knowing, all powerful. And, uh, and so we give ourselves him. So this is why we do this. We, we just approach the Bible as in, in teaching and preaching. We just go book by book, verse by verse. And, um, and we don't try to try to skip around things. We just want to ex- re- receive it as it is stated. And so that being said, uh, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and we're picking it up in 23 today, but um, let, me, let me just go ahead and read it. Here we go. It says, all things are lawful. Now, in your Bible, it should say, it, it should have quotes around that, that phrase, all things are lawful, because this is, this is a quote that Paul is, is, is quoting the Corinthians. The Corinthians, this is something the Corinthians had said. So there had been some correspondence between Paul and, 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 and the Corinthians, and they're having, they're having some issues, and they're writing down their issues, and Paul's going, I know about your issues. Let me talk about your issues. And, and so they're talking about, like, this, this is the, the church in Corinth, that Paul had planted, and uh, and so they're in their correspondence in this letter that they had written to Paul. They're 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 throwing out this phrase quite a bit. All things are lawful. All things are lawful. All things are lawful. And it's something that they would have learned from Paul himself. Paul was a Jew, raised in Jewish tradition. Paul understood growing up that the way in which you connect with God is you keep the Jewish law, which was about 600 plus laws. And so this is, if you're going to connect with God, earn the favor of God, um, this is how you relate to God. You keep his laws. And where you don't, you go make a sacrifice and then God will overlook your, overlook your sin for a moment. And then you, and then you might have to go back. You, you will have to go back again. And, and this is just the way in which life worked. This is just the, the norm of life and, uh, for, for the Jews. And, and then Paul one day met Jesus. And Jesus came and he lived a perfect sinless life. And oftentimes Paul, or Jesus referred to himself as being one who has fulfilled the law. That he is the one that, that what he was doing as he lived his perfect life, he was fulfilling the law. That he, and, and so then the G, Paul comes to find that it's not through keeping the law that gets me, in, gets me into relationship with God. It is through faith in Jesus because Jesus came, lived a sinless died death, uh, life, and he died the death that we deserve in our place for our sin and was raised from the dead. And so it's through faith in Jesus now that we come to God and relate to God. And Paul learned this and he, he, in, in realizing now that that. Jesus has done this, that we are set free from the law. We, don't, we, don't, we are no longer bound under the weight of the law. We are now free by what Jesus has done for us. 
And, uh, and so this was something that Paul just went everywhere and just told everybody about, including Corinth. And so the Corinthians, they're, they're, they're trying to figure out, okay, um, how do you follow Jesus? Because here Paul came in and gave us this, and he preached this message of, of Jesus. And so many of these Corinthians said, I'm in. I believe Paul. I believe what Jesus said. And so they're, they're like trying to figure out, okay, how do we follow Jesus and get to heaven one day? And yet at the, in the meantime, in this life, how do we live like we want to live our life? Like, how do we balance the two? Like, how do we, I want to make sure I get to heaven when I die. I don't, I don't, I mean, the alternative is really stinks. So I don't want to go there. And so I want to go to heaven when I die. And yet at the same time, I kind of just want to do what I want to do on this earth. So how do I balance the two? And this was their ticket. This was it. All things are lawful. Like the law is like, I'm not, I'm not bound to the law anymore. Jesus came, he died for me and he rose from the dead. And so he's given me the way that I can get to heaven. So I don't have to worry about that anymore. I don't have to worry about it. And now I can just live, I can just do whatever, I can sleep with whoever I want to sleep with. I can, I can drink whatever I want to drink. I can eat whatever I want. I can hang out wherever I want to hang out. Why? Because all things are lawful. This is it. This was the loophole they were looking for that I can live the way I want. I got heaven taken care of and I can live the way I want to live because all things are lawful. They love this phrase. They just, they just threw it around everywhere. I mean, they had t-shirts made. They had, they had bumper stickers made. I mean, it was everywhere. All things are lawful. All things are lawful. So here's why Paul brings this up. Because one of the issues the Corinthian church is divided over is what do we do with food that had been sacrificed to idols? What do we do with this food that's been that's sacrificed to idols? Because the answer to that question has been dividing the church. So the normal practice of your average Corinthian was to, it was to go into the temple of the God that you think can help you out. You bring an animal for sacrifice, you make the sacrifice, and then you leave a third of that animal at the altar for sacrifice. And then you take a third of it, you go to the meat market and you sell the meat uh, for a profit. And then you go, um, you, you, you take the rest of the meat and you, you, you right there in the temple in which you made the sacrifice, you invite all your buddies, all your, all your family over and say, hey, I made a sacrifice. I got some meat. Well, it's time to have a feast. And so this was happening all over town. I mean, everywhere there were these feasts happening. It was just like going to your local restaurant. It was just hanging out. You're eating in the, the temple of, of Zeus or whatever. And, and you would have, um, you would have have a nice meal. And so this was happening everywhere. And part of the church was going, yeah, I'm all in on that. I mean, I'm not like, I, I mean, so they were, they were invited to come into that. Like their buddy would invite them to go to this, these feasts or a family would invite them. So they'd bring their family along and they're like, feel totally fine about it. Like I'm, all things are lawful. It's not like I'm going in there to worship an idol. It's just dinner. I'm just going in to have dinner. And yet there was another group in the church that were really struggling with this. They were really having a hard time reconciling like this, but that was like what we did before we came to put our faith and trust in Jesus. And why are we going, why would we, how, is that, how does that work? I thought Jesus was the only way and now we're, we're kind of going into, like, I don't, we don't understand it. So here's what was happening. They were going into, some of, some, of the, some of them from this side go, hey, all things are lawful. We're telling these people, hey, it's fine. You should, come. all things are lawful, bro, let's go. And so they would go in and some of them were falling into the, their formal life. Their former life. They, they would just go back into worshiping all of these idols. Paul says it was destroying their faith. All, all the while, the all things are lawful group were going, man, that's just too bad. That's too bad about them. That's too bad that their faith isn't, you know, grown up enough that they can't handle us because it's too bad. They just don't know what we know because you know what we know? All things are lawful. And Paul steps in and he says, okay, hold on. And here's what he says. He says, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Paul's going, like, you keep, you keep flying your, like, you know, all things are lawful banner, but there's a problem here. You think because you've gotten all your doctrine all buttoned up that you're good, that that gives you some sort of spiritual status in the church. Look, I, I want you to have good doctrine. I, I want you to believe all the right stuff. I, I want you to know the, what the Bible teaches. But your doctrine, what you believe, it is, not, it is obviously not found its way into your life. Like on the outside, you're doing all the right things. You've got the technicalities all worked out, but it doesn't come from a heart that has been changed. All things are lawful, yes, that's true. But the way that you're applying it is not helping anybody. Yes, all things are lawful, but you're using the grace that God has shown you to fulfill your own selfish desires while tearing down the faith of the people around you. 
That is a problem. He says, let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. A heart that has been changed by the gospel, a heart that has been changed by the grace of God will lead you to put the good of others before your own. So for two chapters, Paul has been saying, hey, when it comes to going to these temples to eat this food that has been sacrificed to idols, the answer is definitely no. You're, you're not doing this. We're not going into these temples. This is, this is not okay. And he, he says, one, it's not loving to your brothers and sisters in the church. And whether you recognize it or not, we saw last week, it's actually demonic what you're doing. What you're doing is demonic. Okay, then. All right. So then what about, what about the part of the animal that has been like, like we've, we've left part of it at the altar, but what about the part that has been taken to the meat market? What about the part that's been, that, that has been, like what if somebody invites us over for dinner and they have purchased meat from the meat market? Like what do we do then? What are we supposed to do about this food that's been offered to idols? What, what's the answer, Paul? And Paul's like, I'm glad you asked, 25. He says, eat whatever is eat sold in the meat market without raising any questions on the ground of conscience. For the earth is the Lord's in the fullness thereof. Paul's going, look, you go into the meat market, you just pick up whatever you want. Man, just, just get, what, get whatever you want. Don't get hung up on where the meat came from. So in that day, it, they, didn't, they didn't package meat like we package meat today. Like it wasn't, wasn't the same. It was just, they just, like today, we've got, like you go to the store and it's labeled. It's like, what, were these free range? Was it corn fed, right? Was it happy when it died? You know, that sort of thing. Um, in that day, it was just meat. It was just like there was no package. In fact, if you've been to, some of you have been to like third world countries and, and like you see like on the streets, just, it's just meat, <laughs> literally hanging there like meat and laying there. Like that's it. And Paul says, hey, when you go buy meat, don't worry about it. God made it. You can eat it. It's all good. Verse 27. He says, if one of the unbelievers invites you to dinner and you are disposed to go eat whatever is set before you without raising any questions on the ground of conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for the sake of conscience. He's going to look, an unbeliever invites you over for dinner and he puts a steak in front of you. Like, don't make it a deal. Don't ask any questions. Just thank God that he made cows out of steak and eat it for the glory of God. But if they go out of their way and tell you, hey, this meat has been sacrificed to Zeus. He's like, then don't do it. Don't, don't, don't eat it. Don't eat the food. Because since they know that you're a Christian, you don't want, to get them, you want them to get the wrong idea about these idols and gods and to think that they, they fit in with Christianity. He says, but if someone says to you, this has been offered or in verse 29, he says, I do not mean your conscience, but for his. For why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? He's going, look, you've got the freedom to eat whatever you want to eat. Like Jesus purchased that freedom for us. You can eat what you want to eat. But, I, but for this moment, for the sake of not giving the wrong impression about Jesus, then don't do it. Okay, so the question comes up. What do we do about food that's been offered to idols? Paul says, all right, if it's, if it, if it's in the temple, no. No. On the grill at home? Yes. On the grill at your neighbor's house? Yes. On the grill at your neighbor's house and he tells you it's fresh off the altar of Zeus's altar or Zeus's temple? No, definitely no. It's like, all right, then... What's up, Paul? What's going on? How, do we, how are we supposed to figure this out? What, what do you mean? And here, here's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying it's not the food, it's the place. It's not the food, it's the it, You could say it this way. It's not the menu, it's the venue that matters. This is, what, this is where the problem comes from. The truth is, in following Jesus, not everything is black and white. Not, not everything is like, we, we don't have chapter and verse for everything. Every once in a while, you're going to bump into some things that are just going to, it's just, it's not going to be clear. It's not going to be a chapter and verse. It's just going to be a gray area. Every once in a while, when you walk, when you, when you navigate through life, it's just going to come up. And you're like, I don't, I don't know what to do with this. I don't know whether to go here or there. The Bible doesn't speak to it. So what, it's just going to be a gray area. And we feel this, Right? I mean, there are times that we bump into things where the Bible just doesn't address it specifically, and it seems like we could go one way or the other. 
One writer, one writer described the, or defined the gray area this way, that it's morally neutral, biblically ambiguous, and culturally controversial. So it's, 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 multi, it's morally neutral, biblically ambiguous, and culturally controversial. For the, for the Corinthians, it was food that had been offered to idols. Now, that's not something that we have a lot of trouble with, right? We don't have a lot of trouble with food being offered. It's just not a struggle for us in, in our day, but we do have our own. Like we, we certainly have our own areas that we bump into that are morally neutral, that are biblically ambiguous and are culturally controversial. Areas like movies, film, TV, like what do we do when like there's certain, like what, what do we do about what we watch? I mean, there's, there's what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. Like movies with cussing in it, like what do we do with that? Like what's, I mean, certainly the scripture speaks to why or how we are to speak as followers of Jesus. But then what do we do about watching that on the screen? Like what, what's, what should we do there? What does the, what does the Bible say about watching movie with, movies with cussing? Well, nothing. Or music. Some only listen, some Christians can say, I can only listen to Christian music. And some say, well, I love Jesus, but I just can't with Christian music. And, or about clo- what about clothing? What's, what's appropriate? What isn't? Certainly the Bible speaks to modesty, but what's, where's the line there? there? There are some places in the world and some places in America where women wear, were only wear dresses and would never wear pants. Some always have their head covered. In fact, next week, if you're interested in that, chapter 11, here we go. Next, <laughs> head coverings. Um, but other gray areas, like what does the Bible say about tattoos? What does the Bible say about drinking alcohol? What does the Bible say about smoking or about politics? Some of you are convinced that Jesus is a Republican. <laughs> and some of you are convinced that he's a Democrat. A lot of gray areas. And we all come from different backgrounds. We all come from different experiences, different opinions. And if there's anything that we're sure of in the gray area, we're sure that my opinion is correct and yours is not. So what are we supposed to do? How do we follow Jesus in the gray areas? Well, here's what we don't want to do. A lot of people get really passionate about a particular matter, a particular area, a particular gray area, something that, um, that they're just like, I just don't see how if you do this that you could be a follower of Jesus and that sort of thing. And, and it's, it's biblically ambiguous. There's nothing, partic- there's nothing in the Bible that speaks to this, um, but it's certainly controversial. And certain people, when they, they find their thing, they find that gray area that they're passionate about, and they, even though the Bible doesn't speak to it, they will search and search and search the Scripture to find things in Scripture to support their view. And then, and then they will make their view known. Let me just tell you, that is not the way in which we handle gray areas. That is not the way we do this. That, that is, that we, don't, we, don't, we don't have an opinion and then go proof texting the Bible to, 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 to line up with our, to back up our opinion. That is not how we handle the gray areas, and it's certainly not how we handle the Bible. It, is, it would be wrong and sinful to misuse the Bible in that way. So then what do we do? Well, this is where Paul is helping us out. When you're faced with, what should I do? Like, should, should I eat this? Should I drink this? Should I wear that? Should I have done that? Should I have watched this? When you bump into the gray areas, what should you do? Well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you six questions from what Paul has said in these last two chapters to help us navigate the gray areas. Six questions to run whatever that thing is. When you bump into that gray area, should I do this? Should I eat this? Should I drink this? Should I, whatever it is. You can filter through these six questions to find out, is, is this the wise thing? Is this the right thing for me to do? The first one is this. First question is this. Well, what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? Twice in the last two chapters, Paul has, has told the Corinthians that to think back, to read about what the, the, the uh, Israelites did in the wilderness. Go back and remember what happened to them in the, in the wilderness because the answer, the, the, the example that they gave in the way that they acted in the, in the wilderness will give them the answer they need to whether or not they should be going to the temples for these, for these dinners. Sometimes you may find that the gray area is just not a gray area. A gray or something that you thought was, I don't know, but I don't think the Bible really speaks. Sometimes when you go to the scripture, you'll find that actually the Bible does speak to this. 
that if you would go back to the Bible, you'll get an answer. So what movies to watch can be a gray area for sure. But let me ask you, is the Bible unclear in what it says about watching a woman who is not your wife take off her clothes? Is the Bible unclear about that? The answer is no. The Bible is not unclear about that. The Bible is very clear about what we, Jesus said, that if you, if you look at a woman with lust in your heart, you are guilty of adultery. It is sin. It's not a gray area. When it comes to what seems to be a gray area and you don't know what to do, the first question that you should ask is, well, what does the Bible say? Does the Bible speak to this? Am I just putting this in, an area, in a gray area when it's not a gray area? What does the Bible say? And if the Bible, where the Bible is clear, then you know what to do. And where it's not clear, then move on to some, some other questions. The second question is this, will it give me a guilty conscience? Will it give me a guilty conscience? If I step into this, if I do this, if I, if I, this thing that I'm wrestling with, like, will it give me a guilty conscience? There are some things that the Bible doesn't speak to where it will feel wrong for you, and yet it doesn't feel wrong for others. Is there something in me that thinks this is wrong? Then don't do it. Don't do it. Because if you do something that you believe God thinks is wrong, then you're making a choice to disobey, and that would be wrong particularly if it's something that can tempt you into sin. Like we all have areas where we are strong and areas where we are weak. Listen, where you know that you're weak, don't go there. Where you know that this could lead to something, you're like, but it's not blatantly, it's not sin. It's a, it's a, but if you know that this is weak for you, it could lead you into a place, maybe, maybe it, just, it just feels wrong for you. Don't go there. So the Bible doesn't speak to this, but will it give me a guilty conscience if I do this? And the third one is this, and it's, I'm just going to admit to you, this is something that I, that I don't naturally think about and something that I have to be intentional about thinking, uh, thinking through, and, and that is, will this benefit others? Will this benefit others? I am so often inclined to just think about me and my good, what I like and what benefits me. But Paul says, let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Is this for the good of others, or is this simply for my good? Is this going to encourage someone? Will it build up the community? Or is there potential for confusion or harm to the body of Christ? This is one of the issues with eating the food that was offered to idols. Some of the Christians were seeing other Christians eat the food, and it was hurting their own faith. They weren't just projecting their opinion about what the other person should be doing. They're just looking at it going, if that's what it is, I don't. It was just hurting their own faith, and even causing some of them to abandon Jesus. So perhaps an area where your conscience is clean for you to do something, but you're around with or someone who struggles, uh, or you're around or with someone who struggles with it, and they just can't reconcile that this is something that a follower of Jesus would do, or seeing you would tempt them to do it and then thus violate their own conscience. If that's the case, then it's a no. It's not a problem for you, but it's not about you. And then fourth, will this help the gospel go out? Will this help the gospel go out? This is a gray area. The Bible doesn't address it. It's not morally wrong. What should I do? Will, will it help the gospel go out? Paul says in verse 32, he says, Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. Paul's considering both sides here. Will, will, will it be for the good of my brothers and sisters? And will it help others come to know Jesus? Paul, listen, it's something we know from Paul. Paul wants everybody to know Jesus as their Savior and King. And that's not because he's Paul. That's because he's a Christian. That's because he's somebody who has encountered the grace of God. He's encountered the gospel of Jesus. Like that, that, and he just wants everybody to know. He wants everybody to know Jesus as their Savior and King. So Paul spent his life as a missionary, traveling the world, telling people about Jesus. But not all missionaries travel the world. 
Many of them are stay-at-home moms. Many of them are teachers and plumbers and business owners and students and engineers. And God often uses the ordinary stuff of life to get the gospel to our friends and our family and our neighbors. So I'm faced with a gray area decision. Should I do this? Should I not do this? Well, ask yourself, will this lead people to knowing Jesus? Will this lead people, will this help the gospel go out? Or to put it another way, will this hinder the gospel going out? If somebody sees me doing this, will this hurt my credibility to the gospel? And number five, is this action worth copying? Is whatever it is that I'm thinking through, wrestling with, is it worth copying? Paul says in 11.1, which is, there shouldn't be a break there. That Paul didn't put these chapter numbers in here, by the way. That was done much later. He says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Paul's going, I'm making every effort to follow Jesus. I'm making every effort to be like Christ. I mean, it may seem a little bit arrogant of Paul to say, hey, you know, you're telling people to follow you. But here's, the, here's what Paul knows. Paul knows that people follow people, not advice. That's just the way it is. You can say all you want, but people follow people, not advice. Those of you who have children in your home, you know what I'm talking about, right? Like you've seen this. Like you, you get this. You, you understand that the, the other night, I think this, this past week, we were at the table eating dinner, and, and uh, one of my daughters, I will not call her by name, but uh, one of my daughters just suddenly let out this big old burp. I mean, just loud. It's like, what? And my wife and I were like, this is not okay. You at least say, excuse me. And then my other daughter said, well, dad doesn't. <laughs> and I'm like, hey, don't make this about me right now. <laughs> so. But listen, people are paying attention. People are paying attention. Is, is, is this thing that you're considering, is it something that's worth copying? Think about those that are in your circle. Think about those that, are, that you have influence over. Think about the people that are around you, your, your kid, your, your younger brother, your younger sister, someone who is young in the faith, who is looking to you. Is this something that you would just love it? You'd love it if they would start, they would grow up and do. You would love it if, if it's something that, that, somebody, that somebody is watching your life. You would, it's something that you hope that that person would join you in doing. And then the last question, it's really the question that sums it all up when navigating the gray. What should I do? Ask the question, will this bring glory to God? Will this bring glory to God? Paul says, so whether you eat or drink, verse 31, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. That when it's all said and done, like this is what it's all about. Everything in our lives is measured by the one thing, this one thing that we're here to do, and that is to give God glory. This is the one thing. It's the reason you live. It's the reason God allowed you to wake up this morning, to bring him glory, to reveal who he is. Whether you work or you, you eat or drink or date or raise children or practice law or teach students or walk into a coffee shop or drive or what you look at on your device, all of it is for the glory of God. The reason for everything you do, the big stuff, the little stuff, the mundane, the everyday stuff, when people are watching, when nobody is watching, all of it, all of it is measured by, am I bringing God glory in this moment? In this moment, right now. So, to just help us get a bit practical about this and learn how to put this into, into practice. Um, because what, what Paul is doing here is just giving us a way to think. He's like, how do we think about, like, how do we think like Jesus? How do we think as Christians? How do we think as someone who is following Jesus in a broken world? Well, how do we think? And so just to, just to help us through this, let, let's run a gray area through the grid of what Paul is giving us. Because again, food offered to idols, I mean, that's great. And we see how that worked out for the Corinthians, but that's just not something we wrestle with. So, so let's just take something that's maybe, maybe like not so controversial, but controversial. Maybe that's something just kind of easy, all right? So let's 
I don't know, let's take alcohol, right? Like there's, there's no opinions about that, right? Um, let's, just take, let's just take drinking alcohol as an example. So, all right, so we start with the first question. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? Well, it clearly says to not get drunk. Clearly says to not get drunk. Drunkenness is sin. So don't get near the line of drunkenness. If you're drinking for a buzz, you are clearly sinning. There's no question. Well, what else does the Bible say? Well, if you're under 21, does the Bible have something to say? The Bible says to obey the laws of the government where you live. So it's not even a gray area. This is not even a gray area. If you're under 21, it's illegal and it's clearly sin. The Bible also speaks of being self-controlled and not allowing anything to have mastery over you. So if you need to drink to help you sleep, if you need a drink to help you relax, then that is a problem. If you need to have a drink to have a good time with your friends, that is not okay. And you need new friends. So don't get drunk, don't break the law, and don't use it to experience something. Outside of that, the Bible doesn't say anything. In fact, the Bible speaks of wine as a gift from God that can be received with thanksgiving. It is one of two elements that Jesus gave us to remind us of his death. So then moving on, then, will, will this give me a guilty conscience? If you think that it is wrong for you to take a drink, then don't do it. It would be wrong. Or you could ask, am I strong or weak? If, if you have a history of alcohol, of alcohol abuse or addictive tendencies, then no, you shouldn't. If in any way it could lead you to sin because of a weakness or a guilty conscience, then no. But if not, the next question. The next question is, will this benefit others? And you could just kind of put the two together. Will it benefit others will it cause, or will it cause others to sin? And so you need to be aware of where you are and who you're with when, when asking this question. If you're with some who this is an issue of conscience for them because of their past or they're just, their, con their conscience just doesn't allow for them to reconcile alcohol with following Christ, then even though you feel freedom in it, consider others more significant than yourself and abstain. The next question, does it help the gospel go out? Again, it has everything to do with who you're with and where you are and where you want the gospel to go to and, and who, you're try, who you're wanting to reach, who you're wanting to see Jesus. A few years ago, um, the guys from our small group were helping somebody move into their house. And, and when we were finished, um, the guy we were helping, he, he pulls out this, this wood box and uh, he opens it up and he pulls out a bottle of wine and he... And he hands it to me as a way to say thanks for helping me out. And my wife and I, we don't drink, so it was very awkward. Um, and I told him that I didn't drink and no thanks. And now things were really awkward. Um, and, and, and he just kept apologizing. And, and, and this was a guy that I, I, I'm not sure he was a Christian and, and it's not because he offered me wine. That wasn't why. But I just, I, I just, I, I'm not sure that he was a Christian. And instead of just taking the bottle and having a gospel conversation, it just turned into this weird moment. And where it was just, it was just really awkward. And we ended up leaving. And he just kept apologizing. I didn't mean to, you know, that whole deal. And I was like, it's okay. No, it's all right. What will help the gospel go out? What will help the gospel go out? If they think that it is sin, if they think that this is not compatible with a Christian following Jesus, then don't go there. But if all the other questions are a go, then you have freedom. And then, is it worth copying? Is it worth copying? Parents, what do you want your kids to grow up and do? What do you want your kids grow up doing? Like whatever that is, that's the answer to your question. What do you hope that those that are watching your life will do? 
And then finally, will it bring God glory? Here's a way to answer that question or to help answer that question. Can I receive this and all the while with a clean conscience and a light heart receive it as a good gift from God? Instead of, well, I don't think this is sin. Listen, you will either live your life for your glory or you'll live your life for the glory of God. And Paul doesn't give us every issue to work through here, but he does give us a way to think about the gray areas, how to bring God glory in everything. And what's challenging to us is that what comes natural for me and what comes natural for us is to live for ourselves. What comes natural for us is where there is a real concern for coming from somebody else or a struggle from someone else over what we want to do and over something that we feel freedom in doing. What we want to do is we want to tell them why they should think like us. We, we, want to, we want them to see this is why you should, you should be free like me. You should feel freedom like I feel freedom. Like we want to talk them into our way, our, our way of life so we can continue doing what we want to do. But living for the glory of God and allegiance to Jesus will lead you to live a life that helps others. It will lead you to a life that builds others up. They will, point to, they will point others to the gospel. And it's a life that will defer to their conscience. It will, it's a life that will defer to their, for their good. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds a whole lot like somebody else that we talk a lot about around here. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he humbled himself. He became a servant of us to the point of dying in our place for our sin so that we might know a life that is free from sin and a life that is free from shame. All of this Jesus did for our good and ultimately for the glory of God.